Well, I think we'll go ahead and get started. My name is Dave Ripplinger. Uh, I'm an economist with NDSU Extension. Uh, joining me are, are the Extension Specialists from NDSU Agribusiness. Uh, we're kicking off or rekindling a webinar series on agricultural markets uh, that we started in, with COVID, took a little break, and now we're going to come back monthly. And so this is going to be the first of a uh, monthly webinar series that might last for quite some time. Um, and it'll be scheduled for the Thursday after the WASD release, which is a market release uh, that, data, that USDA has. And so we'll be having these scheduled regularly. We do have a web page that you can check out to see those dates too. Um, we're gonna save questions until the end, although you are welcome to use the Q&A tool uh, to ask questions as well as the chat if, if you'd prefer to do that. Uh, but we'll field those questions at the end of the webinar and, and we'll do our best to get to all of them. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Brian Parman. Hey, thanks, Dave. And you guys can hear me all right still. I assume everything's going good. So uh, I'm going to talk in this, in this presentation a bit about some reports that came out from the Kansas City Federal Reserve uh, in, the last, in the last few weeks, basically talking about lending conditions within their region as well as nationally and with some some within our region which is the Minneapolis Federal Reserve but the the Kansas City Federal Reserve collects a lot of uh, data puts out these excellent reports on ag lending credit conditions they do some stuff with land values and those are free to the public if you just google search KC Fed agricultural reports they pop up and down at the bottom of my, this intro slide that you're seeing I, I'm giving credit to the the authors of these these two reports there that from which these a lot of these charts come so I want to make sure I highlight that but yeah so you know I, I thought about titling this uh, presentation real quick what it what a difference a few months make or uh, or six months makes because there was a lot of doom and gloom headed into the summer, and rightfully so, obviously, based on what, what market prices were doing and the pandemic was doing to uh, the rest of the economy and trade uh, worries and just all kinds of stuff. And here we are today, and, and you know, some of this, a lot of this talk is going to illustrate that, you know, for ag, 2020 has not been a bad year at all. And here you see my first slide, this first uh, uh, chart from the, from the KC Fed. And this is total farm debt at commercial banks third quarter. And you look at 2020 at ag banks, total farm debt is down uh, just over 8%. Uh, uh, and not non-ag banks up 2%, but total, uh, total farm debt at commercial banks at ag banks is down 8%. So the, basically what this is showing is a bunch of people this year in 2020 were not taking on additional debt or going into debt further, whereas the last year, few years, especially 2015 and, and beyond, uh, that, that every year, year over year, there had been an increase in, uh, in debt. So the next slide uh, I'm looking, uh, what I'm trying to show there is farm loan demand, okay? And you can see that loan demand is down, okay? So folks just weren't taking out as, as many loans or going into debt any further or financing stuff nearly as much uh, this year as they had in the past in the Dallas uh, Fed, which is Texas, that, that area, they've been down for a while, but for the rest of us, including Minneapolis, which is us, the gray line, um, they, uh, uh, we, we're, we're down below 100. So the, it's an index that the way to read these is anything below 100 is decreasing and anything above 100 is increasing. And you can think of it as a percentage if you like. But pretty much across the board around the country at the major ag feds, uh, loan demand is down. Uh, folks are folks are just not wanting to to borrow as much money and putting as much stress on the banks. So my next slide though shows non-performing farm loans at commercial banks, and that despite all that, uh, it continues to to trend up in in pretty much all both major categories, which is real estate and non-real estate. Non-real estate being like operating loans or, or well, obviously anything, equipment loans, anything not involving uh, real estate. And then, and then land loans being your farmland purchases. They've been trending up since 2015, but one thing to keep in mind, while this looks pretty dramatic, it's, uh, it's starting from a very low number. In 2015, you know, it was down less than, almost less than 1%. So while it has almost doubled, uh, we're doubling from a really low number. So non-performing loans, 
remains to not really be a problem, especially when you think about after the farm finance or the, the financial crisis of 08, 09, non-performing loans was up closer to two and a half, approaching 3%, and we're still not even, not even to 2% yet. So while it is increasing and it's something to watch, so far, still really not much of a problem. And, and it doesn't uh, look like it will be in, in, in the foreseeable future. So my next slide shows non-performing farm loans at ag banks versus non-ag banks. Ag, ba uh, ag banks being the solid lines and non-ag banks being the dotted lines. And if you look at the dotted lines, obviously when the financial crisis happened, uh, that's the big hump in the middle with those dotted lines. That was all the people, how, how home foreclosures and things like that. Yes, it affected agriculture, but not a lot. And in the subsequent years, I mean, it was it was down pretty low. So as far as non-performing loans went, uh, agriculture over the last several years has remained uh, fairly low. And, and the last time it was even close to a couple of percent was you know several years ago. So it is up, it is higher, but again, it's starting from a pretty low number. All right, my next slide though, that's showing uh, just agricultural credit conditions and some of those charts I understand are pretty small, but for the most, the one on the left shows uh, farm income versus loan repayment rates, okay? And so the Minneapolis Fed, our Fed are the bars in the middle, okay? So farm income uh, is expected to be a bit, was expected to be a bit lower in, in 2020, in the, according to the Minneapolis Fed, while the loan repayment rates uh, uh, are down as well. And then if you look at uh, the availability of funds, you can expect uh, if lo farm loan demand is down, then the availability of funds would likely be higher because if fewer people are supply and demand, right? If fewer people are demanding loans, then the available funds, uh, there's more of them to go around for everyone else. And that's just what this is showing here. All right, so my next slide, uh, this is uh, farm income projections. And I wanted to put this in here because it's interesting. All right, so the slide on the left is, they're both from the USDA. The one on the left shows the projection for 2020 farm income back in February. If you look down at the very bottom of the chart, it says data as of February 5th, 2020. And the projection was that 2019 would have been much better than 2020. 2020 was going to be much like 17 or 18, which were uh, pretty poor years, not the worst since 2016, 2016 being the worst in a long time, but, but pretty bad. And then if you look at the one on the right, that 134 uh, billion, okay, that is the, and then if you look at look at net, uh, net farm income and then net cash income, okay, both of them projected to be extremely high in 2020. And a lot of that has to do with better commodity prices, obviously, but also the CFAT payments, which are included in net income and, and net cash income. And net cash income might be the story there where it was projected to just be 96.7 uh, billion all the way up to almost 120. So over a 20%, what would that be? 21, 22, almost 23% increase uh, versus what they were expecting before. And that's a, that's a very significant, very big uh, increase. So when you look at this, the USDA is sitting there projecting that 2020 is going to almost be as good a year as 2014, maybe not quite, but, but approaching those numbers. So that's, that's some good news. Good news for people in, in the equipment business. Good news for people uh, who might have been struggling to pay off operating loans in the past. It, it looks like 2020 is going to be a year where that's not nearly as much of a problem, especially not as much of a problem as we thought it might be way back in March and April, uh, which seems like ancient history. But I remember we were all talking about uh, calf prices and crop prices being basically uh, in the basement. and. Now in this fall, that hasn't been the case. And you add that with CFAP and all in all 2020 overall is looking like a fairly strong year. Now, my next slide comes from uh, FAPRI out of the University of Missouri, and they do projections for net farm income. And here is, I've shown this, this chart before, but 2020, this is the, is the, you look across the top, you got 2018, 2019, 2020, you come down there, $98.6 billion. Uh, the USDA is projecting even more than that, but it's still significantly higher than 2019 and then uh, definitely higher than 2018. But if you look at 2021, um, it's as low as back in 2018. And a lot of that is because 
uh, they're not projecting a CFAP in 2021. It doesn't, or something like a CFAP. It doesn't mean it won't happen, only that it's hard to project or make statements that yes, we exp that another ad hoc payment is going to happen because uh, you just don't know. They, they require pol pol politicians to act and they may or may not, we, we don't know that now. And then my final slide here is the projections for balance sheets though. So while this cash income and net farm income stuff uh, is looking promising, 2020, they still project the debt to asset ratio to worsen a little bit, not much from 13.6% to 13.9%. And FAPRI is basically just projecting that, and for the most part, it doesn't have as much to do with total assets as it does to do with uh, real estate debt. Okay, if you look at 2020, total at 2019 to 2020, total assets are projected to increase. Okay, but real estate debt's also projected to increase, and it's supposed to increase more, as well as a, a, a it's it's supposed to increase more than total assets increase as a percentage. So you get this higher debt to asset ratio, and that is essentially they're looking at it to continue that this real estate debt number is going to just increase year over year over year, somewhat worsening this uh, this debt to asset ratio. So essentially saying that they don't think land values are likely to come down and maybe move up at an inflationary pace and this de debt to asset ratio approaching 15% in, five, in about five years. But still, we're starting from a fairly low number. So um, all in all, though, uh, we won't have the numbers, the official numbers for 2020 until well into 2021 uh, because of how marketing years work and everything else and, and everybody closing out their balance sheets for the year. But right now, when as we look back on it from an ag perspective, even though there were a few months there where all of us were pretty, pretty nervous, I think we're going to come out of it looking back on it saying that between the CFAP and the better prices and Obviously, Frayne can talk about why why that's the case. Uh, we're going to look back on 2020 as a pretty solid year overall for not not only the nation but North Dakota and everyone else. So, with that, I'm going to turn it over to our next presenter, who I believe is uh, Dr. Olson. So, thanks a lot. All right, thank you, uh, Brian. Um, my task today is to try and give you a brief update on not only the USDA WASDE report that came out at about 11 o'clock today, but also some of the underlying factors is, that are really impacting the marketplace right now. So I'll, I'll start out my first slide um, is the pre-report industry estimates. So let's, ex let's compare what was the trade expecting to see versus what we actually saw out of the numbers from USDA. And the reason this becomes important um, is because the USDA numbers, even though they're forecasts and a lot of private companies will do similar kind of forecasting, that really is that the USDA numbers become that kind of that standard, that, that benchmark that we start to use to say, well, do we think the numbers are going to be higher or lower? If USDA is wrong, why do we think it's going to be different? So that USDA number becomes that, that uh, initial reference point or benchmark that we use to, to compare, you know, what am I thinking relative to what others might be thinking? So in the first top row, oh, excuse me, the first top row uh, is what the, the average trade estimate. So there was a survey of about 25 industry analysts and forecasting firms that put information in. This was the average number that they expected to see for ending stocks. So the ending stocks number is a forecast of how much grain do we believe will be in inventory? How much do we think we'll have in inventory just before harvest of next year? And, and the smaller that number gets, the smaller that our reserves or our, our carryover stocks become, the higher the prices go because cons the prices, the, the in market is worried about rationing use, making sure that we have something left over at the end of the year. But we also see a lot of volatility and market volatility as, as that stocks to use ratio goes down, volatility goes up. So the top row is what we expect, what the trade was expecting to see, the row that's highlighted in blue is the numbers from last month, that's from the November numbers, and then the red line on the very bottom, our row is, is the ones that we got today. Um, so we were expecting, you trade was expecting a small cut in all wheat ending stocks. We did see that a little bit more than what USDA had expected, or the, the trade had expected. Uh, two reasons for that, um, USDA cut the amount of wheat imports just slightly, um, and they also increased the level of exports slightly. And the export increase primarily came from white wheat. So if we started looking at what classes of wheat, it was really a small increase in the forecasted exports for white wheat. 
In the middle column is, is the corn number. There was there basically no change. All of the numbers in the November were the exact same numbers we saw in December. So there's no change in the bottom line. On soybeans, again, the trade was expecting to see a cut in or reduction in the ending stocks numbers. And I want to emphasize that even on the November numbers, that 190 million bushels is a, is a relatively small number for, for soybeans. We haven't seen that small an ending stocks number in quite a few years. So we did see a reduction, not quite as much as what the trade was expecting. Uh, the major increase in usage, the production numbers weren't changed, but the uh, increase in usage came in crushing demand. I think there was quite a few trade analysts that were expecting a slight increase or a bump in the, in the exports number as well. Uh, but USDA left the export forecast the same, uh, but it did increase the domestic crush. Um, interestingly enough, when I looked at the soybean oil and the soybean meal balance sheets, the adjustments made, they made there was really an increase in both exports for soybean oil and soybean meal. Domestic use for oil and meal stayed the same, but they did increase their forecast for exports. So it looks as though it, globally the oilseed market is starting to really tighten up, and that's what's driving a lot of the price increases we're seeing right now. So on my next slide, um, I wanted to give everybody an update on where do we stand for exports and export pace. What's really driving the grain markets and has been for the last several months is two key factors. There's a lot of things going on, but the two biggest ones, uh, number one, Chinese purchases, and number two, the weather conditions in South America, in particular Brazil, but also in, in Argentina. So I'm gonna touch on some of those issues. So as we move forward now in time, what are some of the things the market will continue to look at? Uh, just to, to summarize this table very quickly, I realize there's a lot of numbers uh, most of the information, most of the numbers on this table are 12 month totals or annual sales of U.S. corn to different countries across, around the world who are major export customers. The difference um, is the far right hand column, that far right hand column labeled 2020-21 with a little asterisk on it is the total export commitments and, and again, this information got updated this morning, so I was able to provide the most recent and current information. This is export commitments. So this would be how much grain has actually either been shipped or has been sold, but not shipped yet, that will be shipped in the near future, starting at the beginning of the, of the marketing year. So for corn and soybeans, that's September 1. So these, think of these as the, the amount of grain that has already been sold and shipped or yet to be shipped in, the, in this current marketing year. So these are bushels that now have been committed um, and, and are now held off the marketplace, if you think about it that way, it's saying, well, how much, what's our available supplies? So I want to compare where we are today to where we have been for yearly totals. Typically, Mexico and Japan are, are number, two, number one and number two largest corn customers. I was a little bit concerned given the pandemic, given the COVID-19 uh, COVID issues and the global economic recession that Mexico might have some economic problems. So they are having some, um, but, but the economic problems don't seem to be impacting their ability to buy U.S. agricultural products. Their purchases of U.S. products, both corn, soybeans, and wheat are pretty much right on track with what we would typically see this time of year. So the two, two biggest customers, uh, Mexico, Japan, then we get into kind of the next level down of, of customer base. I wanna emphasize or, or focus on that role with China. If you look back historically, the Chinese uh, purchases of US corn has been relatively small. We really haven't seen any major export sales um, since before the, the Syngenta problem with the MIR-162 trait. And that was one of those non-tariff trade barriers that China used to prevent U.S. corn from entering the, the, the Chinese marketplace. Well, because of phase one agreement, those barriers now have been um, mainly removed. There's still a few in place, but most of it has been removed, which now allows more U.S. corn to flow into the Chinese market. And the Chinese have been very aggressive buyers. If you look at that highlighted red number of 11.3 million metric ton, um, that is by far a record. In fact, it's double the previous record for um, export sales to China. So that has really been the, the um, surprise in the corn market. Uh, I, I was expecting to see China come in and buy some U.S. corn, but not to the levels that we saw right now. And, and I think a lot of other traders and analysts would, would, would agree with that. 
So where are we today? We're, we've got a very uh, steady, fairly aggressive export sales program right now for corn. Most of that going into China, but our other customers are, are coming in and, and maintaining their purchases too. So this is really the underlying driving force in the corn market. The next slide is the same basic table for soybeans. And as you can see, our number one customer by far has always been China. Even during the trade war that we had between US and China during 2018 and 19 marketing years, uh, you know, our export levels were, were dropped significantly uh, during that time period, but China was still the number one customer. Again, now that we have this phase one agreement, China's back in the US market buying uh, US soybeans. Uh, that soybean purchasing has really accelerated. And to be, again, very honest, I think the, um, the numbers that we're seeing today are much more aggressive than I had expected. And I know there was in talking to some, some other folks that do a lot of this analytical work, and, and they were basically in the same camp, that we were expecting larger purchases, but these levels that we're seeing today are, are pretty aggressive. Now, Export sales between the US and China are very seasonal. And we're now reaching that time of the year where seasonally our export sales start to drop off and they start to, to uh, pick up, or at least the, again, the, the, the purchases for delivery later become more aggressive. And I know seeing some reports, um, there's a large portion of, this, of the Brazilian soybean crop has already been sold, even at this time of the year, even though they're pl planting right now, but there's already commitments for the sale coming out of, out of Brazil. So uh, fairly aggressive pace. So I do expect to see as we move forward in the next several months that U.S. export sales will start to drop off. Uh, but again, the Chinese purchases have been very aggressive. When we look at our other major customers, in particular some, a place like Mexico, again, fairly steady purchases. It's been pretty much right on pace. The European Union is a little bit further behind um, what, what we normally see this time of year, but again, their, their sales pace can be somewhat sporadic. Um, the next slide, we're looking at the same information then for wheat. Now this would be all wheat classes built together. Um, the wheat export sales, whether it be export sales or export commitments where the sales is actually shipments that leaving the country, these commitments are not only shipments, but again, what we expect to see late, delivered later on. You know, it's been very steady. It's been pretty much right on pace. Our big customers, Mexico, Philippines, Japan, they've been buying at the regular rates. They've been kind of buying the blend of wheats that we would normally see at this time of year. Towards the bottom of that table, if you notice, there's a row named China or label China. Um, again, a bit of a surprise to the wheat market that China has come in and bought as much wheat, U.S. wheat as they have. Now, approximately half of those sales have been hard red winter wheat. Um, there has been some white wheat sold as well as a little bit of spring wheat. Now there are some rumors now starting to float around. I don't wanna make too big a deal out of this because they're just rumors, but there are rumors floating around that China has an interest in buying some more um, US spring wheat. And, and it would not surprise me at all that that happens. Uh, typically we start to see our spring wheat export season because it's been delayed a bit because of, of changing dynamics in the marketplace, really start to pick up and, and become a bit more aggressive later on in the marketing year. We tend to have to wait until after the first of the year to really start seeing a bit more aggressive sales into the global market. Um, so I, we'll have to wait to see what happens as, as we move forward, but it would not surprise me to see that China comes in and buys a little bit more spring wheat. All right, on my next slide, um, this is the pre-report industry estimates for South American corn and soybean production. And again, I said the two big things we're watching is exports, primarily China, as well as now what's happening in South American weather. Um, so we have a column for Argentina, we have a column for Brazil. The top row is the average trade estimate. So this is what the, 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 the analysts, private analysts were expecting USDA to come out with. If we look at the blue row towards the middle of the table, that was the, the production last marketing year or last year. Whoops. Um, we look at the black row. That is the uh, number that we got in November. And of course, the red one on the bottom is the one we got today. So the traders were looking for a slight cutback in uh, both corn and soybean production forecast out of Argentina. USDA 
Um, did see a slight cutback. We took about a million metric ton out of each corn and soybean, but they left the Brazilian crop the same. They left their forecast for total production coming out of Brazil for both corn and soybeans unchanged from November to December. Now, most of the private analysts were looking for a slight cutback. Um, and I think one of the reasons that we didn't see that is that the crop is still um, young enough that, that, that Argentina is now just finishing up planting. You get into southern Brazil, uh, they, they have finished planting and, and the crop is starting to emerge. When you get into northern Brazil, the crop is emerged, but it's still in the vegetative state. So it's a little bit early to start talking about too much of a yield cutback because of dry weather at this stage, at this growth stage and growing, um, growing conditions. I do want to just really quickly point out, look at the Brazilian corn and soybean production, the far right-hand columns, and compare the blue, which is last year's production, versus what USDA is currently forecasting. The majority of that increase, just for reference, the majority of that increase in expected production is because of increased plantings. The planted acreage or planted hectares have increased. So any kind of a yield adjustment really hasn't come into the USDA forecasting yet. They're still forecasting a trend line yield at this stage of the game. All right, so if we look at the next slide, this is, I just wanted to provide a, a quick reference for where are soybeans produced in Brazil. Uh, Mato Grosso, which is that big state kind of in the middle of the, of the country is the largest producing region, usually accounts for between 25 and 30% of the total production. Um, the, so the darker the, the areas, the more soybeans are produced from a bushel or, or ton standpoint. But it's a very diverse production region. It's a very large country. It has a very wide production zone. Mato Grosso is, is obviously the state that we spend a lot of time talking about. But again, a very large growing region. We have a northern growing region and kind of that southern growing region closer to uh, uh, Rio Grande do Sol. On the next slide, I do the same thing with Argentina. Argentina is a much smaller country, has a very compact, a very concentrated production region for both corn and soybeans. So the corn and soybean production regions kind of overlap like they do in the U.S. Again, a smaller production region, very concentrated. So if, if Argentina has production problems or if they have weather problems that start to show up, the, the likelihood is that it'll impact, have a heavier impact on, again, all of the acres. It's not as geographically diverse. So on my next slide, I wanted to give a, a brief update on what are the soil moisture conditions. Now, this is uh, some computer generated maps. This is just recently updated. Um, I've tried to circle in blue the primary soybean and corn growing regions in Brazil. So that, that highlighted circle is where most of the soybeans are produced. Uh, notice that you do have uh, areas, in spe especially towards the eastern edge of the growing zone, that are still relatively dry. So this is very similar to the, the drought monitor map that comes out in the US, but it's trying to measure the amount of water in the top meter of soil, about the top three feet. Um, this actually has been an improvement for what we saw the last computer runs about two weeks ago. And part of that is because there have been some rain showers that have come through. It's helped improve some of the growing conditions, but the soil moisture in general, soil moisture conditions right now are still relatively dry in a large portion of the Brazilian growing region, which means, again, the market's gonna be watching those weather forecasts very, very carefully. So they've got enough rain to keep the crop um, healthy, but there isn't a lot of soil reserves. So if we miss a few weeks of rains, things could turn, um, turn uh, negative very, very quickly. On my next slide, I do the same thing, trying to highlight that core production zone for, for Argentina. Uh, again, Argentina over the last week or so has had uh, a bit more um, widespread rainfall, enough to at least recharge that, that root zone, but not necessarily uh, given the temperatures right now that they, they seasonally tend to have, um, that, that soil moisture conditions and evapotranspiration rates can change very quickly. So again, there have been rain showers. It's, it's enough to maintain a good um, development and growth right now, but again, the crop is very young, not using a lot of moisture at this stage. So the, the weather forecasts for Brazil and Argentina are going to be watched extremely closely just because they're kind of on the bubble between uh, being a, an effective, an average crop or possibly a below average crop. Uh, my last slide is just a reminder to everybody that the next WASDE report 
um, is going to be on, on Tuesday, January 12th. Um, when that report is released, we will also get the annual production report. And the reason that's important is because that is the uh, when USDA releases their final official production numbers for the 2020 growing season. So we'll get the final official numbers for planted acreage, harvested acreage, and average yields. And, and if there are some adjustments or some tweaks uh, that need to be made in any one of those numbers, it will show up in this report. And the report covers not only the major commodities, but a lot of the uh, minor or smaller market crops as well. So again, uh, January 12th will be a very important day in the marketplace. So uh, be ready and be prepared. And with that, I will turn it over to Tim Petrie for the Livestock Outlook. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Great to be with you again. If we go, uh, go to that first slide, um, today I'm going to mainly talk about what's going on with calf prices, but I do want to call your attention if you're interested in the sheep market. We do have the a monthly newsletter that comes out. Our next one will come out in about a week, I think around December 20th, and I've got an in-depth analysis of the sheep market there along with some charts, so uh, just be looking for that if you're interested in sheep. Go to my next slide. We talk about uh, cattle then. Um, I kind of want to talk about range Ranges versus averages because on my charts and when I get to those charts you'll see that I, I have one price and a lot of people always ask me what are prices going to be and they want one price and and uh, and so averages are that but there is a wide range so you know just go to um, that pur purple line in the middle there for 550 to six weight calves you see this is last week's uh, North Dakota weekly average summary out of USDA they report uh, three markets that's uh, Napoleon and Mandan and Stockman's and and USDA actually issues a report for each of those markets plus the North Dakota summary and so this is the North Dakota summary and the website is shown there if you want to go to it or go to my website and I've got all the individual uh, links there and you can just click on them so uh, last week you know although 550 to six weight calves averaged 159 and that's what you'll see on my chart you see quite a range in prices there 144 up to 167 50 you know 130 40 dollars a, a, a head a difference there so you know this is significant from a marketing standpoint in that uh, I guess if you're selling calves, prefer to be on the top end of the range. And maybe if you're buying calves, the background may be going down under 150 and getting some that you can add value to maybe makes more sense than buying the top of the market. But anyway, that's the range. You know, go down. I'm going to also talk about the 750s to eight. And so, you know, almost a $20, uh, you know, uh, uh, range there. And so, uh, just one other comment that I usually mention, uh, you know, the uh, uh, always is a discount for heifers bigger at this time of the year than when we get into the spring. And so, you know, backgrounding opportunities there too. I suspect we're going to background a lot of heifers. Again, I didn't circle it, but if you go up to, you know, to those of four fifties there at you know one seventy seven and and, uh, and then go over to the heifers uh, about thirty dollars lower but by the time you get up to the five fifty to six the twenty dollars lower and as we keep going on down they get closer and closer to steer prices so that's what makes heifers uh, kind of attractive there so let's go to the, the charts the next slide and I'm going to just discuss the lighter weight calves to begin with. Uh, we talked about. Um, I like to put the last three years on a chart and so now we're almost finishing this year so I'll have four years and I'm ready to uh, take the 2017 line off. But uh, the red line there is this year and uh, so you see we started off the year about right on 2020 right on 2019 until the COVID hit there and and then went down. Uh, also circled there you'll see that the 1917, 18, 19 we hit a 180 there in the spring. We would have easily done that this year again or maybe even a little better than that because we were already at 177 there at in late February, but then the pandemic threw a monkey wrench into things. Our expectations were there 
uh, you know, when we hit that 180, that then we would follow that blue line, which is 2018. And I'm quite confident that we would have done that. You know, the economy was booming, fed cattle were going to average better. And so, uh, uh, we, you know, we had good grazing conditions, at least to begin with. So that's what we would have been. But the red line is where we actually ended up. So uh, again, uh, we did go down, but kind of leveled off there around 160 plus or minus through most of the summer. It could have been worse when we were talking to you uh, at the webinars before. I said, you know, this fall is going to be very interesting. Uh, prepare for the worst and hope for the best. And I think probably we're you know, kind of ended up with more on the best side. But uh, there by mid-August, you see that peak in uh, prices there up at 165, 166, and actually was uh, above the last uh, couple of years. But as Frayne said, then we did run into some production problems on corn and the China came in and with the exports and a whole bunch of other reasons. He didn't even mention them all. Uh, have that opposite relationship between uh, corn and feeder cattle. Rule of thumb is change corn 10 cents, change full calves and dollar in the opposite direction other things being equal. And so that's kind of a, a big thing that I'm going to talk about here in the next minute or so. But yeah, so then we did see some weakness there and corn gets all the blame for it, but that isn't uh, everything to blame as well, because uh, if you, you know, a new drought monitor came out today, but the whole Western U.S., not only only North Dakota, but the whole Western U.S., save a little in the Pacific or Northwest, we're in the North side, is very, very dry. And so, uh, uh, yes, corn went up, but we had early movement of calves, particularly down in the Southwest, where it's very, very dry. More calves in the market there in September than normal, so that put pressure on the market. And then we have that normal seasonal decline that occurs there. So we bottomed out there on October 15th, and uh, so those that sold calves uh, that week there of October 15th that, you know, hit the low for the year. And then since then, we've been rebounding, even though corn has continued up, I guess, and maybe until the last week or two, it's kind of uh, leveled off. But then we did see a bounce in prices. So with corn going up, then uh, why didn't our rule of thumb hold true? And again, it's because of those other things that I talk about. Back in October 15th, it was very, very dry down in the winter wheat uh, country, the winter wheat grazing area, Oklahoma, up into Kansas and down a little into Texas. The winter wheat was planted into dust, did not do very well, but they got it planted on time because it was so dry. But uh, there wasn't winter wheat, and, and that is a spark to calf prices because winter wheat is a very cheap, you know, compared to our backgrounding up here where we have to use harvested feeds, they turn the calves out on that winter wheat that's going to go dormant anyway, so it's pretty cheap. And so that helps the market, but we didn't have winter wheat until it rained there in mid-October. In fact, Oklahoma City actually flooded and they got rain and that sparked the winter wheat and greened up. So then they came in active after calves and that helped the market. And then the other thing too is that uh, the farmer feeders that would be up here more in Iowa and, and Southern South Dakota in there compared to the uh, Colorado into Kansas, uh, bigger commercial uh, lots. Uh, they finished the harvest early. Unlike last year, they weren't on the seats because uh, you know, they they hadn't gotten the corn done and it snowed early and all that. So a uh, combination of factors then uh, sparked our mar uh, calf market back up. So the last several weeks and about the last month, we've been doing a little bit better last year, which uh, again, based on what it was in April, I think that was kind of a feat. So what's ahead in the near term? I think we're going to, you know, kind of take a dollar or two off from them this week with the, you know, the Fed cattle futures market has just been kind of struggling there. And, and for the rest of the year, we're going to get into the holidays and then we don't market much anyway. So, you know, kind of level off there and we got to kind of watch that winter wheat grazing area too, because if it would get very dry down there and, and uh, you know, they, no, no greening or anything. We would start marketing calves earlier. Longer term then, of course, for next year, the big question mark is weather. Again, with half the country being dry and, you know, are we going to have forced 
liquidation and what's the corn crop going to be. So a lot of issues right now, though, I'm going back to the, we're going to start lower than 2018 at the beginning of the year, but that's what I'm using, that light blue line there, again, uh, across as a guideline now with a good corn crop and getting rain. But uh, again, that's the big thing we're going to have to watch there. And the other one uh, uh, is still important, of course, is the pandemic that uh, Frayne alluded to and so on. And, and uh, you know, we're going to get a vaccine and restaurants back open and so on. So that's one of the issues with fed cattle. So go to the next slide. Then we uh, pick up then the heavier weight a yearling 800 pound type of cattle and you know the basic trends are the same there and and uh, you see you know that 142 market last week that's the average and we have that wide range and and so on but you see them going down the same way with the uh, COVID. A couple of things I want to mention on that red line getting towards the right hand side you see that red square there that's November futures that uh, closed actually early in November because of Thanksgiving. So closed last Thursday before Thanksgiving there. And, but you see at 137 and that's right on where our cash market was. So that's how close on the average we do a track with the futures market. And then the orange squares up there are the, uh, what the futures are trading now for uh, next year. And uh, so, uh, again, kind of compared to the blue line, if we go to, you know, we have a January and then a March, April, May, spring futures, then we have the August, September, October, November. So when we get into March, we're, uh, you know, kind of uh, right where uh, we were in 2018. So I'm kind of using 18 again as a guideline. 18 does go up there for the rest of those spring futures. And then uh, in the early fall in 2018, they uh, did really well, but then sparked back down. So for the uh, September, October, we're quite a bit below 18, but, uh, you know, uh, and actually right on where they were this year till they fell off. So we can do better than that if fed cattle do better and the weather cooperates and everything else. And then of course the, the, the futures are kind of right on 2018 at the uh, end of the year. So uh, for the most part, again, use 2018, except probably there early in the fall. But like I said before, we, we got a lot of things ahead of us and weather is my number one concern because of the, of the dryness in the western U.S. and does that funnel over into the uh, corn belt and and and, and uh, how does that affect the cattle industry. So move on then just to wrap things up. Um, these are our uh, you know our calves and our heavy yearlings and then I didn't talk much about fed cattle today. I'll do that in future webinars but you know it looks like now cyclically 2020, 2020 would have been better than 2019, and that would have been our low. But now, with the pandemic, uh, we were hopefully put in the lows here in 2020 back up as the chart shows to 2018 levels in 2021. And then, if everything goes right, pandemic over and again, normal weather and decent corn crops again by 2022, be up. Uh, the highest that we've been for the last several years back to when we uh, came off those 2014-15 highs and we're coming down to 2016. So, uh, you know, it looks like better times ahead, but things can always happen. And and the weather is 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 the big, big question mark for us that we have to watch. So go to the next slide. I want to wish you all a great uh, holiday season. And, and uh, so far the winter has been good for uh, cattle and we hope that continues and let's get some uh, good rains this spring and, and uh, so we can continue you on. So with that, uh, turn it over to Ron. Good afternoon. Yeah, my name is Ron Hogan. I'm the Extension Farm Management Specialist. I hope everybody can hear, you, hear me okay. I was having a little technical difficulty there for a while. So I'm, I, I guess I'm kind of delegated to the, uh, the legislation uh, person on the, on this web on these webinars and uh and and anything covid related as far as legislation or programs and i wanted to talk about the hospital hospitality economic res, re, resiliency grant plus is actually the name of it 
And um, it is actually put on by the North Dakota um, Department of Commerce. It, my next slide actually shows that. And there was some other programs that they had earlier. One of them was just basically called the, the Economic Resiliency Grant. And then, they call, then the next one was the Hospitality Economic Resiliency Grant. And then this new one now is the Hospitality Economic Resiliency, Re Resiliency Grant Plus, and that is uh, uh, especially designed for uh, the lodging sector. Now, these, the, the previous uh, uh, grant programs that I mentioned are now closed, and this one is the one that is open right now. So my next slide will, will tell you a little bit about uh, what, what's involved here. It's for anyone in the lodging businesses in North Dakota that are affected by the pandemic. Uh, uh, in, uh, it is in, there is some businesses that are considered lodging, but they are not eligible, such as vacation rentals, bed and breakfast, campgrounds, Airbnbs. So next, I wanted to talk about um, some of the requirements. Uh, the business must have a physical location in North Dakota. Uh, they must have experienced, experienced uh, an impact due to COVID. Uh, the lodging entity must derive over half of their sales from lodging, and they must have a North Dakota lodging license. Next, the, uh, there's, when you get this grant, it's, it's free money. It's not a loan, uh, and you, you, you need to uh, track this properly, and you can pay wages and salaries from that health benefits associated with that and insurance plans, any kind of safety training, workers comp, uh, but you're not, you are not allowed to pay the payroll taxes. That is not a, a, an acceptable expense. Also, uh, there is other expenses you can pay that, that don't deal with payroll, such as mortgage and rent, utilities, insurance and marketing, and, and things if, if there's, if there's a if there's a, a food preparation in the in the hotel, uh, you can you can provide for that for that and repairs as well. So uh, the next thing I want to talk about was the the amounts uh, you can apply for up to forty thousand uh, dollars. Applicants uh, that have more than one location can apply up to eighty thousand, but only forty thousand per location. So I wanted to bring you that uh, that uh, uh, information. And the last slide just shows you that the closing date is um, uh, is uh, December 18th. It just opened on December 8th. It's a very short window of time to to get your application in. You just do it online at the uh, and uh, and it's kind of self certifying and uh, and so anyway, with that, I I will I will uh, wish you a happy holidays as well and turn it over to uh, David. Hey, thanks, Ron. Uh, so Dave Ripplinger, Bioproducts, Bioenergy Economic Specialist. I just have some uh, quick comments about things that are going on uh, specific to corn ethanol and then a bit about North Dakota oil. Um, you may have heard because it is national news that, you know, passenger travel was certainly down over the Thanksgiving holiday. Uh, but even beyond that, we're starting to see gasoline use, passenger travel, uh, ethanol demand starting to decline. Uh, the question is if this is something structural, uh, or if you know, there's something bad coming on the horizon, there's a lot of concern of, of uh, economic activity going forward, especially after the new year. Uh, and again, this is much more than that seasonal difference. You know, we always see that holiday spike because Thanksgiving is a travel holiday. Uh, we also see just a general decline across the winter season as there's less passenger travel uh, as well, but it's, it's a lot more than that. Moving over to the agribusiness side of things, you know, this weakened demand is, is one side, the supply side uh, isn't, particularly positive either. Uh, right now we're seeing relatively high uh, ethanol production um, and building stocks because we're not using it. And of course, this is uh, kind of things on each side going the wrong way. Uh, just at least surprised to me, ethanol price has been relatively steady in light of this. It's, it's down uh, 10 or 15 cents, but even after yesterday's uh, EIA uh, report, you know, it really didn't move much after that. Uh, looking at how Things are looking economically for corn ethanol refineries themselves. You know, margins are, are low, if not negative, for most uh, corn ethanol refineries. Uh, although, you know, up and to through last Friday, they were producing at, at a pretty steady clip. Uh, but one of the things, and talked about this uh, regularly over the last few weeks, is that ethanol really can't support corn at this price. Uh, they're, they're taking the price of corn and trying to make things work. Uh, but, a, you know, a, a, 
a movement uh, of corn higher is going to take a lot more ethanol folks out of the money. Um, also, just talking about North Dakota uh, oil, uh, WTI isn't where it needs to be to really spur activity. Um, you know, it's been dancing around the $40 range for a few weeks, which is not enough to really uh, heat things up. Just a couple of slides to reiterate the comments I just made. So here's that uh, gasoline supplied. So this is going from refiners and, 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 and folks at the rack, you know, getting it further down that supply chain. Uh, you know, you can see that huge dip that occurred with COVID in the spring, a recovery, not to full levels. And then if you just look at the, that last data point there, you can see that dip. And of course, is that a, 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 a temporary phenomenon or is it something bigger? And again, this is a four week average. So that ends up uh, smoothing out uh, some issues. And there's, you know, there's always concerns too about, uh, you know, weather and, and, and different uh, timing of Thanksgiving in terms of the actual day of the month. But again, since this is four weeks, it, it, it's a little bit, uh, it should even out some of those issues. And again, the number the number is down. Uh, and it is down, you know, if you look at the actual specific numbers, it, it, it's down relative to what that relationship we kind of had uh, from July through October, uh, where things were tracking uh, at that same relative level in terms of, of gasoline supply. Uh, ethanol production, as I mentioned, is, is was essentially a high from the, the low uh, that we experienced in the spring, uh, moving up at a pretty steady clip. And in numbers that, you know, prior to COVID would have been very good weekly numbers, uh, you know, about a million uh, barrels a day, which equates to about 15 billion gallons. Uh, but again, not quite to, to where we were a year ago in terms of production, but again, growing at a time when demand is falling. So again, that's going to lead us to this, which is uh, the storage issue. This is uh, storage in terms of ethanol days. Uh, and that's clearly been increasing at, at a pretty steady clip for a few weeks now. Uh, not necessarily a good sign. Although, as I mentioned, prices have been pretty stable. Uh, again, the, the whole point from this, especially from that general agricultural perspective, is you know, ethanol is in a pretty weak position. Uh, and there's a lot to, to, that remains to be seen of what the winter driving season is going to look like. Uh, last thing, you know, as I mentioned, was just that that WTI spot price in, in North Dakota drilling activity. It's actually surprising is that drill numbers or rig numbers are up uh, the last few weeks uh, from 9 to 14, which is a, on a percentage basis is huge. And even an increase of five is notable, um, even though we're not back to that 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 break even level. I think my number is actually too low. It came down a little bit. So that's at 45. It should be at 51, uh, high above that 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 current price. Uh, that $28, and again, that's in the wrong spot too, that $28 existing well break even, uh, you know, we're clearly above that. This doesn't show up, and I've had slides in recent weeks where you do see that that uh, that period of time where we actually did have a number of pe uh, wells coming offline, at least temporarily, then brought back. Uh, and so now we're just sitting here wondering, you know, if, if we can hit that $60 mark, you know, we're going to be doing well. If not, it's going to be tough. There's a lot of different issues, that things that could possibly move uh, that price. Uh, there's a lot of uh, concerns about environmental regulations, uh, the the interest of the majors in exactly what they want to do with oil, even in the near term. And then there's always a threat of uh, conflict in the Middle East, which uh, as the current administration's days end up waning, hopefully uh, that doesn't get heated up too much. Uh, my point, I didn't, I might not be as funny as Tim's or as pleasant as Tim's, but we only have three weeks left in this year. So, you know, I think we're going to make it, um, you know, we're really close to that finish line. And so, uh, you know, possibly putting for some of us either personally, professionally or otherwise uh, a pretty tough or, or, or unique year behind us. So with that, I'd like to bring all the other panelists back uh, to uh to adding their video and audio. Unfortunately, our Q&A tool is not uh, open today, but you can use chat. So if you'd be uh, interested in ask, asking a question, just go ahead and plug it into chat, either to all panelists or to a specific, uh, a specific panelist. It might work best to send it to all panelists so we can see it, see it and, and double check. We do have one question right now that all I know is intended for Frain. Uh, rest of the world soybean exports seem much higher. What's driving that? China taking more from South America and forcing the rest of the world to the U.S. to find supply? Uh, no, not necessarily. Uh, so the one thing, just for reference, uh, the rest, ROW is rest of world. Um, and, and so I, I, I identified specific countries and then that was kind of 
the, the category for everybody else. Uh, for soybeans, the, the number we've had so far for commitments is about 12.6, just under 12.6 million metric ton. So 12.6. Of that 12.6, I just looked it up, 8.1 of that is for unknown destinations. So what happens when, when a U.S. company makes the sale of, a, of an ag product to another company, um, a lot of times they will identify where is that grain going to be delivered? Well, sometimes sales are made between company A in the United States and company B internationally, and company B doesn't identify which, which country it's going to be delivered to. So then it gets dumped into this unknown category. Now, once the grain is delivered, they're supposed to come back and, um, and modify their, their reporting to make sure that we can track where did that go. So right now, there's been about 8.1 million metric ton that is, is been sold. Uh, some of it's been delivered, some of it's yet to, be, yet to be delivered, but we don't know the country destination yet. So a large portion of this rest of world, this kind of every place else, hasn't been identified. Great. Thanks, Frank. Uh, just a quick reminder, uh, we will be doing uh, this, continuing this webinar series monthly on the Thursday after the WASD. If you saw Frank mentioned that the next WASD is on Tuesday, January 12th. Uh, so our webinar will be two days later on the 14th, again at one o'clock central time. Uh, if there's any other questions, you you know, you do have the opportunity to do that for a few more minutes. I'd ask the panels if they have any other points that they'd want to make, anything that came up uh, after their talk. I guess I would, I'd like to kick that off a little bit, Dave. Um, I just want to springboard off of some of the things that you said in particular about corn and corn demand. Uh, and, and that's something that Dave and I have talked about, I, I guess, privately is, I'm a little bit concerned that as, as prices of corn have come up because of the Chinese demand, which is again, is a very good thing from a uh, agricultural production standpoint, it, the, the increased corn price really has put some pressure on the ethanol industry. And, and in my opinion, it's this trade-off now between um, how much corn is gonna be exported and delivered relative to our domestic demand that, that's really gonna start putting a cap or an upper limit on our current corn inventory. So the only way in my opinion that we're gonna be able to keep pushing um, uh, corn prices higher is we need to maintain that base of exports, but we also need to have uh, energy prices start to increase to allow the profit margins in the ethanol industry to, to be maintained. Because if, if we don't see that kind of an increase, if we don't see prices and consumption uh, uh, start to rebound. Um, as corn prices go higher, it simply means that we're going to have more ethanol plants shutting down and that's going to put the cap on corn prices. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm concerned about too. Did anyone else have a, a comment or a point that they'd like to make? Um, if not, again, we'll be uh, back in about a month. Uh, also, if you want to see the, the slides that we had today, we're recording of this webinar. You can visit the webinar web series page, which is uh, on the board. So basically going to our farm management site and there's an outlook page. Uh, we'll also, it also has the list of, of future dates through 2021, which we've scheduled uh, and the ability to register for those events. Uh, Tim did mention our newsletter, uh, which it comes out monthly. Uh, you know, it's a great resource, has some in-depth uh, looks at some, some pretty practical, but in, an important uh, agribusiness, uh, agricultural uh, issues. Uh, the next one will be out in, in just a few weeks and, and look forward to that. Uh, most of you who've registered, uh, you know, you'll be added to the mailing list. So you should see that in your email boxes shortly. Uh, and if you don't, we actually do have the previous editions archived online as well. Uh, if there's nothing else, I want to wish everybody a happy holidays, uh, safe travels. Uh, hopefully COVID doesn't disrupt things too much. Uh, and then we'll see you next year. Thanks. Mm -hmm.